Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.28, The 1689 Boston Rebellion. Welcome back. Before we jump in for today, I want to give you a brief update on where the show is going in the immediate future. This week, we are going to look at the Boston Rebellion of 1689. Then, next Sunday, there is going to be a supplement episode, and I will talk about that a little bit later on today. Following that, we are going to have an episode that looks at the aftermath of the events we are going to talk about today throughout New England. Our final narrative episode of this season will follow that, and it will look at Leisler's Rebellion in New York and see how that ties into all of this. Then, we are going to have a two-part season in review, just like we did last season. If you are wondering, next season is going to start with the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution throughout the North American colonies. What happens when the Dominion is gone? From there, we are going to take the season all the way through the end of the French and Indian War, which will leave us sitting on the doorstep of the American Revolution. So, we clearly have a whole lot of material to cover, so let's get at it for today. We have spent the past seven episodes of the show discussing the conditions in Massachusetts that preceded the revocation of the Massachusetts Charter and the formation of the Dominion of New England. We then moved on to the Dominion itself and the different issues that had formed up under Edmund Andros. However, as we began to see in our last episode, events in England are rapidly evolving. The Catholic King James II, mostly without a fight, is out following an invasion by William of Orange. On the ground in New England, nobody has more power during the later half of the 1680s than does Edmund Andros. Andros was as loyal as they come. Before he became the governor of the Dominion, he had been the governor of New York, a holding control by then Duke of York, James. Therefore, as Andros rushed back from his fight with the Indians in Maine, he could have had no idea just what treacherous waters he was wading into. Though one would guess that he probably had a pretty bad feeling in the pit of his stomach. So much of his authority, his very legitimacy, was tied up in James II. James II is now hanging out in France, very much out of a job. The New England colonists, who hated Andros with a fiery passion, suddenly were living in a completely new reality with brand new options appearing before them. This week, therefore, we are going to spend our time in Massachusetts, specifically in Boston, as events are going to rapidly escalate, leaving Edmund Andros desperately trying to retain control over a quickly worsening situation. Where we last left off, Edmund Andros decided that it was an important thing to get back to Boston in order to get a grip on the rumors swirling around the colony. Having left his men back in Pemaquid, Maine, to protect against further Indian aggression, Andros himself was trying to figure out the state of affairs, both in the colonies and back home in England. One of the key things during this entire episode in American colonial history is the serious lack of information that was coming in from Europe. By the time that March 1689 had rolled around, and Edmund Andros had decided that he needed to speed back to Boston, rumors were circulating that James II had been toppled. However, as to this point, all the information available was in the form of rumors and conjecture. Indeed, very little real information was making it into the colonies. Obviously, at this point, the most concerning thing not making it into the colonies was any kind of correspondence confirming the events in England. Equally as frustrating as rumors were circulating is that there was no notice on what role Edmund Andrus now held in the colony, if he held any at all. Assuming for a moment that James II had actually been kicked out, which we of course know that he had been, the colonists were left facing some very key questions. Was Edmund Andros still the governor of the Dominion of New England? Was there even a Dominion of New England anymore? If Andros wasn't running the show, then who was? In reality, William had not totally forgotten about his colonies across the Atlantic and had sent correspondence that all the governors should remain in their duties until further instruction. Unfortunately for Andros, these instructions never actually made it to the colonies, largely due to interference with the official notice on the part of Increase Mather, who was still back in London. Specifically, Mather managed to get himself a sneak peek at the letter that would have been essentially reconfirming Andros, 
Mather warned that should the letter be delivered in New England, it would lead to open rebellion. William, now King, likely did not want to rock the boat and agreed to hold off on the letter. Ironically, or very possibly according to Mather's plan, by not delivering the letter, it meant that the rumor mill could take off, which would help spell the ultimate fall of Edmund Andros. For the colonists back in Massachusetts, what had emerged over the past several years of Dominion rule, and really began to coalesce and strengthen during the later part of 1688, was a tense alliance between the former faction and the moderates. Andros has largely himself to blame for the existence of this alliance in the first place. We have spent weeks talking about the fact that Andros had universally alienated everybody in the colony, including many of those who were on his own council and had initially supported the Dominion government. It was through the overly rigid structure that Andros impressed on the colonists, moderates and faction members alike, that drove the two former opponents into the same camp that stood opposed to Andros. Timing also meant that as the rumors of impending revolt to overthrow James II began to spread, and then later rumors that the overthrow had indeed been successful, Andros was nowhere near Boston to try to get ahead of the issues. This brings up the point that it was now James II himself that was suddenly the villain of this story. Andros was the agent of an unjust and importantly Catholic monarch. By quickly casting James II as the primary villain, and Andros essentially being his henchman, it made the coming rebellion in Boston a patriotic act for the defense of England rather than an action against an unpopular governor for personal reasons. Andros was not a stupid man. He understood very well what even the rumors of James II being overthrown might mean for him. The guy was also not blind to the fact that he had very few friends in the Dominion, especially within Boston. Therefore, upon his arrival in March of 1689, the first move Andros made was to embargo the colony's mail to ensure that the news would filter through him first. On April 4th, a young Bostonian by the name of John Winslow returned from the small island of Nevis in the Caribbean. Due to the embargo and the meddling of increased Mather back in England, news was difficult to come by. Winslow, however, was returning from where there was no active attempts to suppress the information. Winslow brought the first detailed reports of events in England, not to Andros personally, but rather to the merchants and ministers of the colony. Andros acted decisively upon learning about this open defiance of his embargo and threw Winslow into jail. However, by this point, it was too late for suppression tactics. The news of what had happened in England was now out there, and it rapidly spread throughout the colony, and soon the unrest in Boston was approaching a fever pitch. Interestingly enough, for Edmund Andros, yes, he was doing all he could to stop the rumor mill. However, he too was dealing with a very serious lack of information, making it back into the colonies. As snippets did come into New England, they did little to provide enough information to satiate the colonial appetites, but it did provide more than enough information to throw into the rumor mill. The response by Andros did nothing to make people feel better about the situation either. His moves to put an embargo on mail coming in from England, in addition to throwing Winslow in jail, just confirmed that there was something big going on and that Edmund Andros was directly involved in trying to keep the information from them. Andros likewise had begun attacks towards the popular Cotton Mather, the son of Increase Mather. Beginning in early 1689, Andros made clear that he wanted the younger Mather jailed and did what he could, ultimately unsuccessfully, to see that happen. Mather would give a troubling sermon on April 14, 1689, where, according to Andros, Mather was justifying a rebellion. In the sermon he titled, The Mystery of Providence, Mather argued that the events in England, the Glorious Revolution, had been God's plan to return the church to providence. If it was justified, indeed part of God's plan to overthrow the religious tyranny in England, was it not the job of the New England colonists to do the same in Massachusetts? Andros viewed this as a direct call to arms and once again ordered that Mather be arrested. On April 17th, not only did Andros order the arrest of Mather, 
but he at the same time decided that this was the opportune time to crack down on those who deserted on their military service up in Maine. This was yet another alienating move by Andros, coming at an absolutely baffling time. And quickly, he found that nobody was really all that interested in enforcing those arrest warrants he was issuing. So then, here is where we are on the night of April 17th, 1689. Andros, who has spent years alienating the Massachusetts colonists, has now ordered the arrest of Cotton Mather, as well as the troops who deserted on the war up in Maine. The rumor mill was spinning wildly, feeding upon snippets making it into the colony, largely due to the interference from Increase Mather back in London. People such as Cotton Mather were becoming brazenly open about their approval of the Glorious Revolution. With the news that James II had been toppled, the very legitimacy of Andros still being the governor was now in question. If the rumors and news out of England were indeed false, Edmund Andros was taking all the right moves to prove otherwise. Even the war that Andros was engaging in up in Maine had become increasingly unpopular by this point, with many having taken up the belief that the war was part of a greater scheme by Andros to spread Catholicism. With few friends left in New England, Andros was left trying to retain control over a colony where he was seen as the ultimate outsider. During the early morning hours of April 18th, colonists fed up with the years of abuses came together. Forming into 12 militia companies, they proceeded to march into Boston. Beating drums announcing their arrival in the city, they were met from Thomas Turfrey, who was in command of the Boston Regiment. When the militia met with Turfrey, they demanded that he immediately surrender under the threat of the militia opening fire on him. Apparently not interested in getting himself killed, Turfrey ended up running into the fort and taking refuge, while the angry, though organized, mob marched on. Every time they came upon an ally of Andros, they arrested him and kept moving. The years of constant alienation under the reign of Edmund Andros had suddenly come back to haunt the beleaguered governor. The Boston Artillery Company, which was led by local militia leaders, happened to be in Boston on the morning of the 18th. They quickly decided that they would be joining the angry mob and marching through the city. As the angry mob moved their way through Boston, arresting Andros' allies, they made a critical arrest that would likely remove any kind of defense that Andros could have theoretically posed. One of the first arrests that the angry mob made was of Captain John George. George had been with Andros since the time he came over from New England and had transported him to New England on board the Rose. The Rose, an English frigate, had been sitting in Boston Harbor with its guns pointed towards the city. By capturing George, the colonists greatly reduced the chance that Andros would order a bombardment of Boston. As the events of the morning of the 18th rapidly gained followers, there became a need for the colonists to quickly get control over the events. The last thing that any of them wanted was for this to become an unchecked outbreak of mob violence. The solution was a group of influential men in the colony to meet at a townhouse in Boston. Importantly, the makeup of this group that emerged to lead the rebellion was a mixture of both the old members of the faction as well as the moderates in Massachusetts. It was decided that Governor Bradstreet, now in his 80s, would lead the council overseeing the rebellion. Edmund Andrus had become aware of something going on at around 8 a.m. that morning. However, following a report that nothing was actually going on, it's all good here, it would be another hour before Andros did anything at all, when the noise from the mob became unmistakable. When the mob arrived outside of Fort Mary, where Andros was staying, the numbers had swelled to over a thousand colonists, with more pouring in from Charlestown. Andros, at this point, had a very serious problem, as he had very little ability to actually defend himself. Right outside of the fort that Andros was in, there were over a thousand angry and armed members of a mob. Andros had a handful of officers, including our old friend Edward Randolph, and some 14 troops at his disposal. While the fort, and therefore Andros, did have cannons that could fire on the crowd, Andros wisely held off. Other than not wanting to turn the situation into a bloodbath, 
Andros was probably getting somewhat anxious about escaping the situation alive. Therefore, Andros would have quickly realized that he was not about to fight his way out of this. Instead, he made the offer that he would like to go speak with the leadership of the rebellion, a request which was denied by the leadership because the streets had become too dangerous. Simon Bradstreet, now back as the governor, made clear to Andros that there really was not another option. He was surrounded, he was outgunned, and the only real option on the table for him to consider at this point was a full surrender. At the same time that a demand was being made that Andros surrender, a group of men back at the State House were working to defend and, more importantly, give justification to their actions that day. What emerged and was being read aloud by mid afternoon on the 18th was the declaration of the gentlemen, merchants, and inhabitants of Boston and the country adjacent. This is an interesting document, and I do encourage you all to read it. However, if you would rather listen to it, I'm going to be doing a supplement in the next few days where I will read the document in its entirety. This is going to come out next Sunday, so yeah, be excited because there is going to be a bonus episode coming in just one week. As a quick side note, even though the name of the document is in fact the Declaration of the Gentlemen, Merchants, and Inhabitants of Boston and the Country Adjacent, from this point forward we are just going to refer to it as the Declaration of the Gentlemen because otherwise that is quite the mouthful. I'm going to take on the Declaration of the Gentlemen from a couple of different fronts. First, we are going to look at the document itself and what it put out there. Second, we are going to look at the effect of the Declaration. And then finally, I want to spend some time discussing if the Declaration of the Gentlemen was something that was written as a response to the events of April 18th, or if rather it was prepared in advance of the events going on which would obviously draw into question how spontaneous the events of the Boston Rebellion actually was. Most likely penned by Cotton Mather, the Declaration of Gentlemen begins by framing the entire event as a continuation of the Popish plot. Mather suggests that the Popish plot has actually been an ongoing attack on the religion of England. He rolls in the attacks on the Massachusetts Charter into that plot to help reintroduce Catholicism into the English sphere. The Declaration asserts that the original vacating of the Charter itself was illegal, as the Massachusetts colonists didn't have time required to travel to Westminster to defend their Charter. Mather then goes directly to the heart of the issue, and openly calls Andros absolute and arbitrary in nature. The Declaration describes the complaints we have spent so much time talking about. The arbitrary passing of taxes, the massive changes to the justice system, and the general exclusion of the Massachusetts colonists from the government. Mather returns everything back to the fact that Andros had violated the rights of the New England colonists under the Magna Carta. The real purpose of the Declaration of the Gentlemen, however, was twofold. Yes, it was a critical layout of the list of grievances against Andros. Likewise, it was important that these grievances be more than simply mere complaints but rather that they be fundamental violations of the rights of Englishmen. Second, the decision to overthrow Andros needed to be directly connected to the events back in England, hence the language about the Popish plot. The Declaration would frame the struggle in New England as being an extension of the struggle in England itself. Andros, a close supporter of James II, was an extension of the very thing that William of Orange had overthrown in the first place. The New England Declaration of the Gentlemen therefore served a dual purpose. Internally, the document was meant to bring a sense of order to the rabble of April 18th. Rather than an uncontrollable riot, the Declaration of the Gentlemen helped reframe the events of the day as being an extension of the Glorious Revolution taking place back across the Atlantic. The New England colonists would likewise have hoped that upon getting a copy of the Declaration, likely at the same time he learned about the overthrow of Andros, William would realize that the New England colonists were always working to further the thing that he had started when he had decided to overthrow James II. The colonists were simply extending that battle, William of Orange's battle, to the North American colonies. They could not overthrow James II directly, however they would certainly overthrow his agent. At approximately the same time that the Declaration was being read to the people, 
efforts were well underway to get Andros to surrender Fort Mary. For Edmund Andros himself, he likely knew at this point that his fate was largely sealed. He was greatly outnumbered, and any backup he would have received from the Rose had been neutralized that morning. By the afternoon hours of the 18th, it had become time for a now reluctant Edmund Andros to go meet with the new council in the Dominion. The new council, made up of former members of the faction, as well as moderates and even several members from Andros' own council, would meet with their now former governor. Though there was some degree of discussion between the council and Bradford, Andros and his aides relatively quickly found themselves being placed under arrest. Defeated, Edmund Andros ordered the surrender of Fort Mary, though getting him to make such a concession did involve putting a gun to the chest of his longtime associate, Edward Randolph. Once Andros came around, it was Randolph, once again acting as a messenger in our story, who got to deliver the news to Fort Mary. Though there was again some initial resistance to the surrender, the then leader of the fort reluctantly agreed when the colonists promised not to arrest the 14 English troops in the fort and allow them to relocate. By the end of the day on April 18th, the Dominion government had largely collapsed. Andros and his closest associates were now prisoners. Throughout the next day, the mob would progress arresting more of the former leaders of the Dominion of New England. Joseph Dudley, the original governor of the Dominion, was picked up in this round of arrests. There was a brief bit of tension surrounding the Rose, whose crew, upon seeing the events and their commander arrested, decided that the prudent move might be to take the Rose to France and join with James II. This decision, however, did not fly with the Anglican members of the crew, who decided instead to strike the rigging on the ship, essentially taking the Rose out of the battle entirely. The final holdout was a fort on Castle Island, right on the coast of Boston. Upon seeing the rigging come down on the Rose, they gave up the final holdout of resistance. By the end of the day on April 19th, the Boston Rebellion was over. Despite the rapid overthrow of the Dominion government, there was not a single casualty in Boston on either side. With the Dominion government having unraveled at such a startlingly quick pace, I want to look at the events of that day and examine exactly what had happened. Was the rebellion in New England something that was spontaneous, or was this something that had been pre-planned? The evidence points to the fact that the rebellion was not necessarily spontaneous. Indeed, there is ample evidence that they had been building in the direction since the fall of 1688, when Andros went to Maine. Rather, the rebellion in Boston was something that was more advantageous of the moment than anything else. Led largely by its chief antagonist, Cotton Mather, the seeds of rebellion had been carefully grown in the weeks, and especially days before the uprising on the 18th. For instance, Mather had given his sermon about the providence of the glorious revolution. Now, Cotton Mather was not a stupid man, and he realized that the message that he was giving was lost on absolutely nobody. It is also worth noting that several of the militia up in Maine had returned to Boston on April 17th, the day before the rebellion. It is unknown if the returning men were doing so on their own accord, or if they had been given information of what was about to go down. However, the militia pouring into Boston would prove to be a critical part of quickly helping secure the city and in essentially cornering Edmund Andros. And again, while there is no evidence of exactly why the men returned, and outright not wanting to be in Maine anymore seriously cannot be totally discounted as a possibility, it does seem like a pretty huge coincidence that they would return the night before a major rebellion took place. It further must be noted that the men being led back from Maine were under the command of Waite Winthrop, who claims that he reluctantly took charge of the men. Regardless of if his command was indeed reluctant, it cannot be discounted that Winthrop also arrived back to Boston, where he was amongst the councillors suddenly in charge of the colony. Cotton Mather himself would, years after the events that took place in April of 1689, write confirming that he had helped in the preliminary planning for the overthrow. Well, one can charge that Mather may have been using some revisionist history here. It seems likely that planning had indeed taken place beforehand. One of the common threads for historians discussing the planning is the highly organized Declaration of the Gentlemen. Based partially on the Declaration of the Nobility, Gentry, and Commonality from November of 1688, 
the ideas that wound up in the Boston Declaration were certainly making their rounds. It is also worth noting that earlier today, when we talked about John Winslow being thrown into jail because of the information he brought into the colony, it was most likely a copy of the Declaration of the Nobility, Gentry, and Commonality that Winslow brought into Massachusetts. We know that this document was being reproduced and published in Massachusetts, so the information contained within by this point was common knowledge. There were key differences between the Boston Declaration and the English Declaration. Specifically, the English Declaration was attempting to bring people around to a cause, whereas the Declaration of the Gentlemen was attempting to justify actions that were already underway. While the form was roughly the same, the fact that the Declaration of Gentlemen was attempting to justify their behavior does seem to suggest that at least the Declaration was written contemporaneously with the events that day in Boston. The question therefore becomes, how do we reconcile a document that is both very carefully worded and structured with the reality that the document points to having been written contemporaneously with events? The most reasonable explanation seems to be that there had been a large degree of planning into the eventual overthrow of the Dominion of New England. By those days in the middle of April 1689, the wheels were already turning towards an eventual overthrow of Andros and his government. The return of the militia under Winthrop from Maine, combined with the radical sermon of Cotton Mather days before, suggests that the rebellion was in fact imminent. What is far less clear is if the beginning of the rebellion had in fact been planned for the morning of the 18th, or the rapid speed that it progressed is something that was planned for. In other words, if you were to ask Cotton Mather in the days before the Boston Rebellion whether or not April 18th was the day that it was going to go down, it is a bit less convincing that he would say yes. If you were to ask more generally if a rebellion to overthrow Andros was coming, it seems more likely that he would have given you an affirmative confirmation. Well, it does seem as though those working on the Declaration of the Gentlemen did in fact have a lot of work to do on the 18th, the evidence indicates that the broad strokes of what they were going to be writing had already been decided upon. The rebellion that does come was a rebellion of the elite. With men like Bradstreet, Winthrop, Mather, and Stratton amongst those involved, these are the men that we have been talking about for weeks. The council that formed was extremely similar in makeup to the council that had served back in 1686, right before the Dudley government had taken over. This was not an uprising of the general population, though certainly they did get involved. This was an uprising of the elites in the colony, attempting to rescue their colony from the grips of the autocratic Andros. While it does look probable based on the evidence that there was active discussion in advance of April 18th about overthrowing the Dominion government, that does not mean that it was common knowledge amongst the average citizen. Based on the accounts that exist, it seems like what happened on the 18th was a natural growth through people wanting to join in. A small group of people on the inside began planning on the early morning hours of the 18th, preparing to march on Boston. As they moved on Boston, people who had not previously been privy to the plan joined in and marched along with that initial group. Just like that, the rebellion began to rapidly grow as more and more people joined the now quickly gathering crowds. Moving forward, we are going to spend a good deal of time talking about the long-term effects of the events of the collapse of Andros's government. However, in the short term, the repercussions for the colony were dramatic. While the Dominion had collapsed, a return to a time before 1686 was also now out of the question. For the last several weeks, we have focused closely on that alienation by Andros of just about everybody in the colony. This alienation had two huge effects. First, on the surface, it made everybody hate Andros. More importantly, however, moving forward, the alienation of both the faction and the moderates alike pushed these two opposing forces into an uneasy alliance. This alliance meant that the overthrow of the Dominion government did not come solely from the more conservative faction, but rather from both parties the faction was going to be unable to claim victory for themselves, which meant that they must now enter a new reality where they were no longer going to have that domination over the government of Massachusetts. <laughs>
they entered into a world where they were going to be forced to share power. For the members of the faction that had so tightly controlled the reins of the government. This diversification meant that there would never be a return to the government that had run Massachusetts for the past 60 years, but rather something different entirely would need to be formed. This would have been unthinkable just a few years before. The colonists were going to be facing a very new and unknown reality coming out of the ashes of the Dominion. As we are going to see, largely next season when we get more into the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution, the peace that emerges between the two sides is going to be tenuous at best. The moderates, now in the government, want a new charter to be formed. The faction predictably wants to return to pre-1686, despite the fact that their hegemony on the government has now been broken. That, however, is not going to stop them from trying to rewind the clock. With the events in Boston progressing so rapidly, by the time that the other colonies begin to learn about what had happened, the events were already largely done. Next time, we are going to spend our episode looking at the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the Dominion government, both in Massachusetts and throughout the rest of New England. However, before we do any of that, I will be back here next Sunday with a bonus episode where I read you the Declaration of the Gentleman. With that, I hope you are all staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here in one week's time for the reading of the Declaration of the Gentleman, and then again the week after that, where we are going to look at the aftermath of the Boston Rebellion. <laughs>